Uh, yay! Welcome to the December uh, 2017 meetup of uh, Drupal NYC here at 30 Rock. Woo! Yeah! All right. What did you? Someone said Chicago? Well, no. Okay. Um, here we go. A couple quick housekeeping things so everybody is aware. Um, uh, please mute your devices if they go jingle jangle. Um, please use uh, a mic to ask questions during the uh, event so that everybody can hear your question and we don't have to repeat it. Um, uh, restrooms, we do have restrooms here. Um, uh, women's room is stage left hallway on the right. Uh, men's room is stage right hallway on the left. And then there are gender neutral uh, restrooms uh, stage right hallway most of the way down on the right. Questions, comments, concerns, jokes, poems, comments, no. Okay, good. Um, the uh, the Wi-Fi information is down at the bottom of every slide, so if you need to get onto Wi-Fi. Um, you know what just occurred to me? I think this is the first time this has ever happened. There is no, there are no women in the room. Wow. There is one? Thank goodness. Okay, we got to do better, everybody. Um, okay, here we go. Agenda. So we're doing announcements right now. We're going to have some talks. We have some good talks lined up. Um, we may kind of shuffle around the order of the talks um, uh, to, to be determined because uh, one of the speakers um, we're still waiting on. Um, and then uh, some quick uh, closing announcements. And then uh, Bill's Bar afterwards. There's an after party sponsored by our good friends at Fastly. I'll talk more about that in just a minute. Uh, so today's talk, uh, talks rather, um, we have Drupal and web forums as public policy tools supporting online voter registration. Um, hopefully, we're waiting for him to arrive, but, and here he is. I just saw his reflection in the, in the mirror right there. Um, that's going to be given by um, uh, New York City Council Member Ben Kalos, who's walking in right now. There he is. Um, and then we're going to have another talk on commerce um, 2.x, the recurring billing, um, by Bo Young. Where are you? There he is. Uh, did I say it right? I'm terrible with names. I did. Awesome. Okay. And then load testing with realistic user journeys by Matt Glamon. Where's Matt? There he is right next to him. Okay. Perfect. Um, awesome. So we have some great talks lined up. Uh, real quick, here are some, uh, some photos of your fancy uh, uh, Drupal NYC organizers. We'd like to put this up. If everybody has feedback, has questions, whatnot, you want to make the next, um, uh, the next uh, meetup even more awesome than this one, come find some of the organizers and, uh, and talk to us about helping out or talk to us about suggestions or feedback. We really do appreciate it when we get that. So here we go. That's us. Um, our venue right here at 30 Rock, sponsored by NBC. Thank you, NBC. Woo! All right. Uh, the after party, Bill's Bar downstairs. Uh, there will be directions in a few minutes. Sponsored by Fastly. Yay! All right. Thank you, Fastly. Um, uh, photos. So we will be taking photos during the course of the evening. If you take photos, that's great. Make everybody jealous that they weren't here. Um, uh, please use the hashtag, uh, hashtag DrupalNYC on all of the various um, uh, social media outlets that you uh, post these photos to. And uh, you know what's great is, is Monty's going to be taking photos, and Monty is also the top photo. That works out really nicely. That was not planned, but that works, works out perfectly. OK, so some quick announcements, some quick upcoming events. So first, um, Drupal Global Training Days. The reason there's a little question mark at the end there is because we're trying to find somebody who wants to host this, right? So if you are interested, or your company might be interested, or your organization might be interested in hosting a global uh, training day, um, please come talk to some of the organizers. Joe, uh, in particular, has done this before, and, and he can help kind of walk you through the process and what's involved. Um, but we are definitely looking for some folks to, um, to help out with hosting that event and organizing it um, coming up in January of next year. Um, uh, Drupal Camp New Jersey and Drupal Camp NYC. So I'm going to ask Joe to come on up and talk about these, uh, these two events, and we'll go from there. Great. Thank you. Big round of applause for Alex. Actually, how do I click through? This uh, green, button. green button, that makes sense. All right, well, so first off, anybody here is going to be thinking about uh, submitting sessions for Drupal Camp New Jersey? Drupal Camp New, New York. If you guys are thinking about submitting for Drupal Con, uh, this is a really phenomenal way for you to practice. Create your sessions, try them out in February, try it out again in New York City. And you know what? It, you can hone it and it, you could. Hit it out of the park. Come uh, Drupal Camp's April, like uh, Drupal Con is April 9th, 10th, et cetera. Yeah. 
So let me tell you a little bit about Triple Camp New York City. It's, it's the, uh, it's, this is uh, really exciting. Uh, it's 12 years of Drupal camps in New York City. Uh, yeah, I'm happy to say that one of the first uh, camps was planned uh, by Jacob Redding, who's in the room today. He's one of the founders of Drupal uh, New York City, our, uh, our community here. So welcome back, Jacob, for the night. I, I brought the logo up here for you, Jacob. We don't use the same one. We got this gritty pigeon. I gave it an orange wig, but it, I was told to get rid of that one uh, this year. So we're, we're, we're going to try to get a new logo. But uh, we've done more than 12 uh, Drupal camps over those years. But uh, principally, it's an unconference format. Does anybody know what an unconference is? Does anybody not know what an unconference is? OK, so basically, very, very simply put, what we do is uh, whoever shows up, you hopefully have prepared sessions. At the beginning of the day, we just put out uh, st sticky notes. Everybody writes out the kind of session ideas. We select them. We organize them into tracks. And then basically, whatever you guys show up with that day, those are the presentations. Sometimes we just do potluck sessions where something's not planned. We're just doing demos. Um, there's a lot of other stuff that goes on. You know, We do uh, sprint work. We definitely do Drupal ladders work or mentoring, uh, usually. We have one large um, lecture hall room where we do Drupal 8 training, beginner training, um, which we'll need somebody to uh, lead this year. We've had uh, a couple of folks uh, offer each year, but you know, if any of you are interested in doing that, let me know. So our target date, early March. Right now, John Jay College is looking to give us either the first weekend in March or second. It depends upon what's going on in their, uh, their school uh, planning. Uh, the website needs a little TLC. We're on the latest version of Drupal. We are on Pantheon. Site's built, works great. We don't really need to enhance any functionality unless, of course, you guys think we do, in which case you could build it. But we could use some help with uh, a design refresh. Otherwise, if none of you want to help with that, I don't want to hear any complaints about our design this year because it is what we, uh, where we're at. Um, Registration is going to open in January. We are going to, this year, have t-shirts for the first 100 people who register. So think about that when you're registering. Uh, if we get a very quick, uh, if we get up to 100 very quickly, we might consider uh, adding to uh, our uh, t-shirt order. But for now, we've got to kind of keep it to that. Uh, and then, can I get a show of hands of who might volunteer? for uh, Drupal camp. It could be as simple as just coming that day. Uh, Lonnie, Jake. So great. You know, usually us the usual uh, folks. Thank you. If you could see me at the end of this meeting so I can get your, your contact information. Uh, it's really very lightweight, the volunteer work that we've got to do. Um, and it's pretty well planned out. So uh, you'll just let me know what kind of things you're interested in, and we'll take it from there. Any questions? Great. It will be, it may be on a Sunday. It's usually on a Saturday, but again, it depends on uh, John Jay's, uh, the, their availability of, of uh, classrooms and so forth. So, um, great. You know, the other thing is, is if you guys, any of you work at a company, we are looking for sponsors. The way we do the camps is it's always cash flow neutral each year. The funds are managed by the Drupal Association. So we have funded 2018's camp, what we collect money is for is for 2019's camp. So each year we roll forward so that there's never any risk of not having funds in the camp. We always keep the same budget in there. DA gets money uh, on top for managing uh, all of that, and it's well worth it. The DA does a great job uh, helping us with pretty much everything uh, on that front. So thank you. I'll turn it back to Alex. Thank you, Joe. Joe Bahana, ladies and gentlemen. Well done. There we go. Okay, uh, a couple other quick things, and then we'll uh, we'll get started with our speakers. So, um, uh, speakers, we are always looking for uh, new great topics for people to talk about. New great speakers to come up and, and share your wisdom. So, if you um, if you would like to speak about something, if you have a particular topic that you're interested in, um, or if you have a, a specific topic that you would really love to hear or talk about, come and talk to one of the organizers. Talk to Joe. Talk to me. Uh, Holing's not here today. Talk to any of the organizers, and we will uh, will definitely 
Um, uh, uh, see what we can do. Yes, Joe. On that note, for January, we really do need speakers for uh, that first week of January. It's a little bit light right now, so if you've got something you're thinking about uh, presenting, we really could use your uh, your presentations. Thanks. Truth. Okay. What else we got? Um, uh, who's hiring? Raise your hand if you're hiring Drupal developers or related. All right, everybody look around the room, see whose hands are up. Everybody look around. All right. For all of you who are looking for your next great opportunity, go find these people at some point during the meeting. All right, uh, that's my kid, by the way. He turns five on Saturday. He's cute, right? Yay! If anybody wants him, let me know at the end of the meeting. You can have him. Okay, um, here we go. We're gonna, we're gonna uh, skip the introductions today. We usually do quick five minute intros, but I think we wanna get right to the speakers. Um, so everybody look at the person to your left. Say hi. Everyone look at the person to your right. Say hello. Now everybody has to come to Bill's bar afterwards and actually have a conversation with that person that you just said hi to. Okay, so here we go. Um, all right, great. So if you want to come up and, and plug in, I'm going to. Um, I'm gonna. I, I got a quick intro. Here we go. So uh, New York City Council Member uh, Ben Kalis was elected in 2013 to represent the Upper East Side, Midtown East, Roosevelt Island, and East Harlem, along with 8.4 million New Yorkers in the New York City City Council. Um, as, an attorney and f uh, as an attorney and free and open source software developer, Council Member Kalo serves as chair of the Government Operations Committee, where he has sought to root out patronage, eliminate billions in waste, and to use technology to improve access to government. He has become a leading advocate for education, affordable housing, public health, sustainability, development, and transportation, as well as universal broadband, open data, and digital democracy. Uh, he is also the founding co-chair of the Free Law Founders, and national coalition of leaders in and around government to set the law and legislative processes, law and legislative process free. His office is open and transparent with constituents invited to decide on how to spend $1 million on local projects, which I just voted on one of those, by the way, or sent one in, um, in the district, as well as to join him in conversation on first Fridays each month. He is also my councilman, um, in case, that's right. Um, uh, he was just reelected in November. I voted for him 11 times. Um, and I'm gonna turn it over Ben Kalos. Yeah. There you go. My pleasure. All right. You need a microphone. Please. Whew. Okay. Thank you. Uh, vote early, vote often. I'm, so I'm uh, City Council Member Ben Kalos. That's at Ben Kalos on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Pokemon Go, and uh, even on Drupal.org. Uh, and so or I, I have a number of you who live in my district. Uh, Forrest Mars lives in the proximity of my district office at 93rd and 2nd, so I see him and his chihuahua quite frequently. Uh, and so every time I see him, I get roped into coming here. I try to stop by once a year, every year, because you're my people. Uh, so uh, first question, does anyone here live on the Upper East Side, Roosevelt Island, East Harlem, or East Midtown? Anyone else? Okay, great. Good, good. So originally, I, I mentioned to Forrest that I was upgrading from D6 to D8. So this is the old D D6 website, and I actually haven't had a chance to theme it. But uh, we, it's, it's been moved over. The D6 to D8 process is actually incredibly, incredibly easy. Uh, having done other upgrade paths from perhaps D5 to D6 and D6 to D7, sometimes those were painful. but in this case, I popped the uh, the database and uh, file system right over, and it was fine. The only problem is, uh, based on all the advancements that were made in D8, I got a little bit frustrated with how how poorly I had designed my uh, D6 website. Uh, it's it's massive. So what I wanted to come and talk about was online voter registration. Uh, so, uh, how many people here are registered to vote? Wow, okay. Uh, if, if you can, please please do. Uh, and so, I can tell you how you register. Actually, how many of you, you use the New York State DMV's online voter registration system? Wow. Uh, 
But, but New York State has online registration because if you have a driver's license and you go to the DMV website and you create an account and then after you create an account, you then verify it, then look at your driver's license, make sure that it's entered, then go back onto the system. And I don't know whether or not you have to give them a credit card, but whether or not you do, then you're able to, if your driver's license, has anyone here moved in the past five years? Uh, and does your driver's license have the new address? Because if it doesn't have the new address, then you can't register based on the new address. But we have online voter registration in New York State already, so why do we need it in New York City? Uh, so that being said, uh, there, we're, we're in the 21st century, so uh, now it's time. So what I will say for everyone in the room, because no one raised their hands, you register to vote uh, with a piece of paper and a pen, which you then sent through the mail to somebody who then data entered that information into a computer. Has anyone here ever looked at their name in the poll book and found that it was wrong? Really, that is, that is low. Uh, I, one thing is if you ever look and you can't find it, sometimes they reverse your name. So I know somebody named Douglas Keith who's in the poll book as Keith Douglas. Uh, but that reversal makes a big difference if you're in Hollywood. Uh, but uh, that being said, so there's that. There's typos all the time. Uh, and so um, I figure that now that we're in the 21st century, we can do cool things like online voter registration. So what ended up happening was I was already working on this D8 site, and uh, I was playing around with web forms. Uh, has anyone noticed that web form has gotten like ridiculously awesome? <laughs> Yes, is that person here? Is Jake Rockowitz here? That's yay! Oh, there you go. Okay. Uh, so anyway, he's he's going to come into the story soon. Uh, but like it, it has eaten everything else uh, because it is uh, so awesome. So I'm sitting there and I'm fighting with the city to pass this legislation. So um, do folks care about the the nerdy law stuff? I see a couple of nods. Okay. So, <laughs> the best. I'm a lawyer too. Any lawyers in the room? Uh, so, if you ask a lawyer the best way to win a case, the answer is on a technicality, uh, because uh, you can't get appealed. Uh, it's objective. It's like math. It's like software. You know where the bug is and you can fix it. So, the state law prohibits us from doing online voter registration at the board of elections. However, there's another law that says an electronic signature is a signature. So the New York State Attorney General, Eric Schneiderman, uh, put out an opinion and he said, if somebody generates, takes the voter registration form and loads it into a fillable PDF and allows you to sign it and then they print it out, you can then hand it to the Board of Elections and the Board of Elections has to register you. Okay, so we're gonna take a digital form, we're gonna print it, so that the Board of Elections can then data enter it, take a picture of the signature, redigitize it, then print it into your poll book so you can sign it on election day. And even though this sounds completely ludicrous, it is legal. And so says the New York State Attorney General, his name's Eric Schneiderman, he's been making Donald Trump have a bad day every time all of us have a bad day. Uh, so we took that opinion and we ran with it. And so as this goes, a lot of people came out and said, duh, this is a great idea. But what ends up happening in government is people don't understand how we can do it. I, they, they just, I would like one of you to please run for office in 2021 if you didn't run in 2017. Was anyone here interested in running for office? I will talk to you later. Anyone else too? Okay, see me afterwards. It's incredibly painful, but like <laughs> we actually need people who understand software in government and like at the end of the day, most of what government is doing is really down to a content management system. Like if we had a better CMS for government, like life would be better. Uh, so I was arguing with the people who were saying, we need five years to get online voter registration done. And so I started going to the other states and the 36 other states that do it. And I was trying to see their systems, but I realized that it was actually faster to use web form to build an online voter registration form. So I did. Uh, and it took me about an hour or two, um, and that was while I was learning all the cool new features. <clears throat> so am I a citizen? Yes. Uh, am I older than 18? Yes. Uh, let's see, I, I could have used one of the things that fills it out for you, but I'll, nah, it's fine. Um, when am I born? I will go with then, because that would make me just old enough. Uh, 
New York State does not have a uh, gender neutral option. So sadly, it might be faster if I use a mouse. Don't have to give emails. Uh, And this is more just a demo of how awesome uh, Web Forms is. I got lazy. Uh, I did not put in all the other counties. There are uh, 62 counties in New York State, but only 58 on the voter registration form. Uh, and have I ever voted before? Yes. And then there's another piece, which is in New York State, you actually have to give your DMV number or your social security number to verify your identification. So let me just tell everyone my social security number. That's easy. It's one, two, three, four. You can trust me. I'm a politician. And I am a registered Democrat. I was elected as a Democrat. Uh, I might want to apply for absentee. Who knows? And so here's the thing where folks, and, and yes, I, I, there are things I could do to make this form a lot better, uh, or the community could, but this was literally like just shaming elected other elected officials and shaming the administration into like, I am, I, I am quote unquote, just a normal politician, and I built this in an hour, why can't you build this in an hour or a day or two or three or whatever? And when they're like, but it's open source, I'm like, yes, it's something that the DOD uses. Uh, yes, the DOD uses a uh, uh, Drupal. So then the piece that they didn't get, and I needed this specifically to show them, is like that you could just take a picture, that I could take my phone, and I. You did a, literally demoed this on my phone for people, then had them sign on a piece of paper, took a picture of it, and then uploaded it to show them. And this is a paradigm shift, because folks don't realize when they're like, well, how do you get the signature? And I had to explain to them and show them, like, right on a piece of paper, so like, seeing is believing. And then the other piece is this cool <coughs> new feature on web form, on web forms, which is, uh, signing with your uh, finger. So I can literally sign my uh, voter registration form using web form and like literally this is probably very true to form uh, with my finger. And uh, now I can register to vote. Uh, I didn't put in my zip code. Oh. The worst errors are human. Uh, and, and so the, the last piece of it was, okay, I was able to show people that you could put the information in and it can display it back. I didn't get a chance to put in your dev version this morning. I tried before work, but uh, my site was angry with me. Uh, so anyway, this is where I was. And so I decided I would just do what everyone else does, which is, I logged on to Drupal and I was like, I want to show people the signature. So I wrote and I said, uh, when using web form signature element, signatures are stored as a, I, I'm not going to repeat that. I'd like to display a signature back uh, to the user on the confirmation page and on the email confirmation. So I, I posted this and this random person, uh, Jay Rockowitz, uh, who happens to be a maintainer, responded pretty much within hours uh, to start working on it. They've posted everything. Uh, and believe it or not, I, <laughs> at the time I was doing this, I had a campaign account with quite a lot of money in it. So I said, I, I hereby offer to pay for this. But uh, uh, Jake felt it was just easier to get it done and do the pitch, patch. And I think that's something beautiful about the community. And so um, I thought this was kind of cool and just a story to share about how one project and a maintainer and other people uh, had an impact on uh, public policy for the city where people will actually be able to register online. Uh, if you're interested in this specific project and building a prettier version, uh, I can pull up what the New York State voter registration form looks like, but I don't want to take up too much time. But we'd be interested in working. I don't want the city to waste like a million dollars building this, even though if you want to get paid that million dollars, especially if you're an MWBE, I'm interested in you getting paid it but it's just really hurtful for me to see us wasting your, our, your tax dollars paying a vendor like, no offense to Adobe, to just build a live PDF form when we can actually just build it in Drupal or something else that is equally secure. Uh, so that is the end of the story. It, it's happened. If you're free on Friday, the mayor is signing it. 
Uh, so if you're interested uh, in coming to the bill signing, you can come meet the mayor. Uh, we may have the attorney general there, so you're also welcome to join. But uh, we are literally using this web form here that took like an hour as I was learning things. Most of the time it took to like just enter all, in the, all the information so it looked the same as the voter registration form, which was painful. Uh, but uh, literally to this day in every single press article, and so yes, it uh, passed the city council, uh, the Daily News has a splash. Anyone here work at the Daily News? Okay. Uh, so many, why did I load it? I usually have my ad blocker on. But anyway, so it, it's passed, it's been reported on, and one of the things uh, that we've been doing in the articles is we've been shaming the city by saying, like, I built this whole voter registration system in an hour, and uh, can you please do it yourselves in less than two years? Uh, so, and, and in the bill when we negotiate it, you never really get what you want. So the bill actually says they have two years to get it working, uh, which is ridiculous. I am happy to take questions. chance you can get an amendment to force the people in government to come to the people meeting? <laughs> well, 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 you've got one person here from government, so uh, for, for what that's worth. And uh, actually, the bill is intro 508, which is, okay. So yeah, if you go on Google, uh, uh, let me Google that for you. And uh, the second thing that comes up, at least on my Google search, since they per personalize these things for you, is the actual bill text. Uh, and if you click text here, you can actually read it. And so one of the other cool things is that it has an API built in. Uh, so they're gonna have to do API because government is really bad at building things. And uh, the other piece is, uh, yeah, I think that's just the bill text, but I think the thing that kills me is uh, the mayor and folks go around saying like, we did it, we did it, we did it, but they have 18 months to make it happen and that's really frustrating to me. So always look at the enacting clause. Uh, on, on Obamacare, a lot of the provisions from Obamacare didn't actually ever fully kick in because it got repealed before they did and they didn't have the courage to get it done immediately. Uh, uh, other, other questions, serious questions. Yes, hi, oh, that, that was great by the way. Um, how about phase two biometrics? Uh, the question is, what about biometrics? So it's it's interesting. It, it there's a uh, societal differential. Uh, as far as I understand, based on Wired articles I've read, in India, uh, you have a very large population. Uh, there's different levels of uh, uh, literacy, and so I think they just went in your ideas. Your they use biometric identification. Uh, I see folks nodding. Do you happen to know more than me? Would, do they use a fingerprint or eye, eye scan or? Both. They use a fingerprint and eye scan. Uh, that being said, in New York City, we used to fingerprint people who are receiving food stamps. And uh, as an attorney, the first thing you do when you become an attorney is they fingerprint you because attorneys can be criminals and they wanna be able to track you down if you're doing something wrong. So based on the, the societal norms in America, the the overall feeling is, as Americans, we prefer not to have our fingerprints or eyes scanned. Uh, even DNA database issues have had a lot of civil liberties fights. Uh, that being said, if you have an Apple and you're using, if you have a computer and you're using that thumbprint login or Google, like, great, you just gave your thumbprint to Google and they will sell it. So uh, government can't have it, Google can. Uh, Council Member Kalos, thank you for coming to our meeting tonight, uh, and really thank you for uh, sponsoring this this uh, this legislation. The question I have for you is, how is this going to get project managed? Is it something that you're going to be able to be involved with with respect to requirements or implementation, or are you now hands off and some other government entity is going to potentially drive this into uh, the uh, in you know another regions of our Internet. Wouldn't it be cool if I told you that the city used Basecamp or uh, what's the other one we used at uh, Civic Commons? Um, they just got bought. I think uh, they just bought Trello. Um, Atlassian tools. Zendesk, yes. Et cetera. I did not like Jira. I, right, I did Jira. not like Jira. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry. I, I we we use Trello in my office. We use Trello at Civic Actions. Uh, 
I have had multiple hearings that might be the most boring hearings you've ever said about the mayor scene, which are about the mayor's management, and the city of New York does not have a project management tool. Let that sink in for a second. Uh, in my office, we, we use Trello for project management. Uh, we've gone to uh, Trello to say, like, we don't think it's working for us right, and they said, you can't have 4,000 live projects and live cards at once, you're breaking it, and that's not how it gets used, so they, they actually changed their system, so we get a warning every day. Uh, it's at the top of the screen, I can show you my Trello board, it's funny. Uh, but what typically happens is lawmakers pass a law and they move on to the next issue. Uh, I did another law, and I may have spoken about it here before, which was uh, the open law. So, uh, there's the free software principles, and one of them is you need to have access to the code, right? Yes? Like, ac access to the code is fundamental. So I'm a city council person, my job is to write legislation, so I'm going to modify the code. So I asked for a copy of the code, and what did they say? They said if I wanted to access the city's code, I would have to pay $150 a month to LexisNexis or Westlaw for a subscription to pay for the access to the code that I'm supposed to write. So I, I actually wrote that law. It is one of my, I'm very proud of it. It was uh, law 37 of 2014, and so I followed it. I have oversight over the law department, and I said to them, where's my project? And of course, they had to get it done by a certain year, and they didn't. And I followed up with them, and I embarrassed them, and then they put out an RFP, and in the RFP, where I had written a law that said the law has to be free, they said, we want the vendor in their winning bid to say how much they're going to sell the law for. <laughs> so you folks are smart enough to know if you're trying to sell something, if you're trying to monetize it, then you have an incentive not to offer it for free. Uh, and so I made them redo the RFP, they put it out again, it got picked up by a new publisher, the old publisher, because it was closed source, refused to release the city's code to the new publisher. Uh, which I think folks can relate to when you're taking over for a, a, a proprietary website system, which Drupal often does. And so after a year of fighting in court, almost going to court with them, we got the city's code back, and then they put it online. And uh, actually, I can show it to you because it still doesn't follow my law. <laughs> uh, so hold on. We Google New York City law. We go to... Uh, the Law Department website, which is completely useless because it is buried here. Sorry, give me one second because this is, I think it, so if you click, yes, so if you click here, it has the laws of the city of New York, which takes you off-site to America Legal Publishing, which has this place, and so if I want to down, if I want to access the law, I get to go through these lovely, uh, JavaScript menus, and then if I want to save it, so this is this is something I'm proud of. Uh, you used to not be, hold on, they did, maybe they didn't do it. So hold on, let me just click on this. Let me save it. It should, yeah, that was supposed to be fixed, so give me one second. I, I got them to add a link on the main page saying that here's how to download everything. So give me, so useless. So anyway, I wrote this law, and as you can watch me struggle in front of folks, and is this being live streamed? Oh, more the better. <laughs> uh, so anyway, the law says you should post to be able to just download the whole thing as a bulk download, and uh, it's going to be fun when the law department hears from me. Uh, wait, hold on. Here we go. It's uh, You can download it here, so I skipped past it. So uh, if I want to download the whole law as an XML, we can do it. We can't go through the normal interface, which I will remind them I need them to add a message. All they have to do is change that error message. They're also not used to law and policy makers who can be like, all you need to do is change that error message over there uh, and, and redirect them back. So um, we have that. That being said, it still doesn't follow all the laws. So there's a program out there called States Decoded. It's free and open source. And so I'm trying to get them to move it from uh, this to uh, if anyone's actually interested in this, I think I got city employees to do this. Um, but aren't you glad you asked a, a innocuous and simple <laughs> question about project management? Uh, let me see if I can pull up Miami-Dade. So this is great. 
<laughs> uh, no worries. This is what is great about doing live presentations. Uh, if you go to States Decoded, there are a couple of, there we go, let's see if San Francisco Decoded is still live. So, nope, they're gone too. Okay. Anyway, there's this great software called States Decoded, and uh, I think it's kind of cool, and I want to see the city do so, maybe? Yeah, no. Okay. We're working with them to try to use free and open source software, and I see somebody face palming, which is how I feel too. Any, do I get another question, or have I used all my time? Are there other questions? Learn not to ask. Oh, I don't know. We got one right here. So you probably already answered this. Um, and New York has a pretty good community around this. Uh, but my question would be, how could we in the tech community, without being elected, which I'm sure some of us want to be, um, myself back here, um, but without joining, like, uh, joining the ranks of government, what could we in the tech community do to help you guys? Is that getting involved with like, you know, open gov, open data, keep continuing to write open source software, but are there things that we can do that would advance sort of your fight within the ranks of government? My biggest request would be to work with this group here to get you to bid on a lot of the technology projects that the city is paying small companies like IBM and Accenture and others hundreds of millions of dollars to build when we could probably build it better by adding a module or even just creating a, a new uh, project on, on, on Drupal. So I think that would be one first, like, can you take my money? And by money, you're like your tax dollars. So that would be the first piece of like, can we create a working group from here on trying to connect people who live and work in the city and pay taxes in the city, because that way I get the money back that I pay you, uh, to connect you with government contracts. So that's my first request. Uh, the second request is uh, kind of like, uh, I kind of made a small pitch on this. I would really love for the community to consider building the online voter registration system that the city is going to use, in which case I would sit you down, whoever is interested, uh, if you would talk to, can I nominate Jake? Uh, nominate <laughs> Jake, uh, but if you go to Jake or I and I'm uh, bkalos at bencalos.com or any of the other ways you can track me down and say, hey, I, I want to build this for the city for either pay or no pay. Uh, I just want to build it. Uh, I'd love to bring you into the room with the people from the city who have no idea how any of this works. Uh, treat them as the client, build it in an agile fashion, and maybe even just hand it to them two hours later. Uh, but <laughs> that being said, if you want to go through the full development process a week later, this would be a very quick, I, I would say one day sprints on this one, because uh, it's very simple use case. Um, I think those are two. The other piece is I have two bills that I believe are going to die at the uh, end of this session, which is uh, I would like to pass the free and open source uh, act, which would uh, move us over to having, uh, so, so part of it is also advocacy. There are a legion of free and open source software developers, but folks are busy working, making money, and coming to meetups like this, and folks aren't participating in government hearings. They're lovely, they start at 10 a.m., they run till 5 p.m., and as long as you take a day off from work and don't make money that day, you can have two minutes to have elected officials maybe ask you questions and then not understand your answers. Uh, and so one is free and open source preference and the other one is that the city should just make all of its software available in a Git repo or whatever the successor is. Once upon a time there was an idea called Civic Commons. That idea has long since passed and been surpassed by uh, Git. So I think that that's another piece. And then um, last but not least, I do these things called uh, First Fridays. I meet with my constituents 8 a.m. to 10 a.m. first Friday of the month. We brainstorm with Ben the second Tuesday of every month where I try to uh, meet with folks. Um, I'm doing a town hall with the mayor on Thursday. Uh, I see there are at least two people who live in the neighborhood. I would love somebody to show up and ask the mayor, like, uh, what is the city doing to use more free and open source software? Uh, and I would just perhaps watch the mayor's jaw drop of, like, what's that? And then have to get an answer from somebody. So 
uh, showing up counts uh, in addition to voting for me 11 times. <laughs> All right. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. My pleasure. Be back next week. Thank you. Is this your water? We have to remember to open them for our uh, speakers right. the next time. Okay, so we have uh, some special guests tonight to, uh, that, that flew in from, from three different parts of the, uh, the world, actually. So I'm going to introduce the first one. Uh, Ryan Zrama. I don't know if you guys know who Ryan is, but he's been working in the uh, Drupal project since 2004 or 5. I told him he should come in with a cloak and like a, a shillelagh. Uh, <laughs> But he is the inventor of and the maintainer of Ubercart. Anybody use Ubercart a million years ago? He is the founder of and uh, lead maintainer of the Drupal Commerce project. And without uh, any further fanfare, I'm going to invite Ryan Zrama up to introduce uh, the next speakers. Uh, right, thank you, Joe. And thanks for having us here this evening. Um, Joe has been trying to convince me to come up and talk about Drupal Commerce for a little while. And I thought rather than just come up and do a presentation myself, I'd fly Boyan in from uh, Belgrade uh, and uh, Matt in from Milwaukee so we could just all come to a Drupal meetup. Um, but realistically, it's a good opportunity for us to connect as well because we generally only see each other twice a year um, at DrupalCon North America and DrupalCon Europe. So this is a nice midway point for us between Vienna and Nashville. Um, so we'll take the day tomorrow in, in Brooklyn to eat good food and talk about the company. Um, so I'm the CEO of Commerce Guys. Um, we founded the company in 2009, at first to support Ubercart websites, um, but then we, uh, for trademark reasons and other reasons, we had to sort of recreate e-commerce on Drupal, and that's where Drupal Commerce was born. Um, and so we, we still maintain Drupal Commerce. Uh, Boyan is now the lead uh, developer for the 2.x branch. I think you just tagged the 2.2 release today. We're doing once a month on Wednesdays, trying to be more predictable, actually have a roadmap and help people understand where the project is headed, um, as opposed to my, my very uh, lackluster maintenance uh, schedule for the 1.x branch, which is one release every once in a while. Uh, I think it was maybe 12 or 14 months between the 1.13 and 1.14, but we're trying to get better. Um, and so Boyan will be here talking about Commerce 2.x, its current status. Uh, and also the recent work that we've done in partnership with Torchbox, a UK-based digital ag or Drupal agency, um, to port the recurring modules, subscription-based modules to Drupal 8. And then Matt will talk about load testing with realistic user journeys, uh, which is to say you can't just hammer a server and then uh, trust that you know however many requests you initiated against the home page of your website uh, equates to how much load you can expect to handle its you know full scale in production because, of course, users that submit add to cart forms and checkout forms and other parts of interactions on the site um, will really skew, I guess, how much uh, traffic you can actually handle concurrently. So Matt will talk about that. Um, Boyan will take it away first with um, Commerce 2.x's update. And just so people know where we are at just a high level, um, we began porting Commerce to Drupal 8 really in, in uh, the summer of 2014. Um, I sort of set our pattern for how we would um, define our entity types and field types on Drupal 8. That quickly became outdated and Boyan deleted every bit of code that I wrote and then re-implemented our entity uh, de definitions um, because really the, the APIs just were, were still changing out from under us at the time. Um, but uh, we, we hit uh, kind of a full release for all of these libraries that we wrote to, to kind of just um, provide some foundational components for Drupal Commerce modules, so like a standalone addressing library, a standalone currency localization library, these kinds of standalone things that don't need to be locked into Drupal. We released those first, and then the Commerce 2.0 beta at DrupalCon Dublin, um, and then the 2.0 full release, I guess, was just in advance of DrupalCon Vienna. Um, so that, that's kind of the schedule. It took us, I guess, a little over three years from beginning to architect and then developing and releasing everything to get out on Drupal 8, and then there's a lot of work that's still ongoing. Um, so I'm going to hand the mic to Boyan and let him share with you what is most recent about it. Um, and yeah, if you have any questions for either us, you know, we'll, we'll do questions all at the end together. Seems this works. 
So as Ryan said, we had this long release process that ended on September 20th, where we released Commerce 2.0, and we had 13 release parties all over the world. So we had one in India, one in Pakistan, in Germany, in France, in Finland, in Serbia, in the US, in Canada. And the great thing about these release parties is that they were mostly hosted by agencies implementing commerce to the text websites and contributing back to the project. And this is one of the things that we tried to do uh, when we were basically rebooting the project for Drupal 8 to create this rich ecosystem of knowledge and agencies and contributors. And I can say that today we have easily over two thousand two dozen agencies launching Drupal Commerce websites every day. And many have like more than five or even more than 10 websites already launched, which surprises me every time. Um, some of the, okay, slide. There we go. I have no clue what's going on there. It's Matt's slide, so you can blame him. Uh, some of the other numbers of our health. So we started with 1,600 installs on September 20th, uh, which has already risen to, 200 and, uh, to 2,400, uh, which means that every two months we gain about 1,000 websites, so people are launching, uh, despite the fact that our docs still leave a lot to be desired. But this time we realize that documentation is essential to our adoption and to how people implement websites. So we've started this effort at docs.truplecommerce.org where our docs are a static website built from a GitHub repo uh, where anyone can click edit and edit some text and when they submit a pull request is open for us to merge in, which means that anyone can contribute uh, and uh, we can go from there. Uh, Matt has already spent a lot of work on that where we now have an outline of the perfect docs we want to have one day and now we just need to do everything else. <laughs> but uh, it's happening and I'm very happy to see it. Um, of course, the, the number of installs doesn't matter much if we cannot see the websites and one of the main ways that we communicate what we've done is through case studies on Drupal.org and last time I checked there, there were nine really, really great case studies. There might be more now uh, that cover these multi-month complex projects that, uh, that have already launched or ha even have been in production for over a year with Commerce 2 and with Drupal 8. We also have a very active community on Drupal Slack and Slack has been much better for us than IRC simply because we have people in all time zones, which means that you can wake up and see the discussion from last night and then continue from there. And that has led to people talking a lot more than they did on IRC. Uh, and Matt recently checked and he realized that commerce is actually the most uh, active channel on Drupal Slack right now. So we are number three, number three in terms of members. We only have like 500 members, but we have the most messages, which is pretty impressive. Even if half of those are people asking us for things that should be in docs, but you know how it goes. Uh, Another great thing that we did is that we reevaluated the feature set of the Drupal 7 module and identified which functionality is crucial for a majority of websites. And then we added features to core. And since Drupal 8 is a much better platform to develop on, uh, the new commerce is the same size as the old commerce, give or take. But we have removed the need for half of the most popular Drupal 7 contribs. So there's 30 modules that you no longer need with the new version, which is very impressive. And we have miles more of tests. I'm not sure that's a valid comparison, but bear with me. Uh, and still the size is similar. So that just shows how much better the platform we have is, where we no longer have to reinvent three reference fields like we did in the Drupal 7 times before we wrote entity reference and so on. Um, we launched with over 30 payment gateways available. So this is why the whole development process took uh, a long time. We realized that it's not just about commerce. It's about the whole platform and ecosystem and what you can do with it. 
So we basically postponed the 2.0 release to focus on writing a great shipping module, to write important payment gateways so that people can hit the ground running from day one. Uh, so that means that pretty much most gateways you can think of are covered. And this doesn't sound very impressive in the US because everyone uses PayPal and authorize.net, but in Europe this matters a lot because every country has uh, their own gateway. Uh, the, the shipping module replaces five independent modules from the Drupal 7 time, and it supports multiple shipments. Uh, it supports having multiple addresses for multiple shipments, and we built this for a site call, called Interflora, uh, which is huge in Europe and is used to deliver flowers. So you can log on there and use commerce to buy uh, three bouquets of flowers and send it to three different addresses, uh, which I guess can be convenient when you're in, you're in your 20s. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we have a great initial migration path from Drupal 7 and Drupal 6 uh, through the Commerce Migrate module, which provides uh, migrations uh, based on the Migrate API that's in Drupal Core. Uh, and people are also now starting migrations from WooCommerce and Magento. Uh, they are in early stages, but it shows that at some point we will be able to just point at a website and just get all of the data out without doing uh, a lot of extra work, which, which is truly important and can make certain projects a lot more possible. In the bottom, you'll see a list of the actual gateways that we currently have uh, in case you want to, to reference that. Uh, we've also revamped our approach to our partnerships. No longer do we accept every partner who wants to be our partner, uh, but instead we are really focusing on the ones that are the most popular and the most likely to be needed by a website. We know that most people want to use authorize.net or PayPal, and in case of PayPal, Braintree is pretty much the best API that they offer right now. It's miles ahead of everything else. Uh, of course, in the US, sales tax is crazy enough that if you have Nexus in other states, there's just no way to do that without an external tax cloud. So we par partnered with Tevalera, and it goes on from there with partners such as MailChimp uh, and Amazon Pay. And these partnerships ensure that we can uh, maintain these modules and, and ship fixes constantly. Uh, if you want to see a demo of Drupal Commerce, how it looks, how it works, there is a great demo at commercedemo.acromedia.com, which is our partner from Canada. And it actually has a guided tour through the various features, so it's great for selling commerce to people. It will show you the faceted search, the catalogs, all of the bells and whistles. Uh, or as someone on Twitter said that they overheard, the Belgian whistles. Um, we, so Ryan mentioned that we now have a roadmap, and th the reason for that I is logical. When you release a new platform, you have 100 paper cuts that a user will encounter. Uh, bugs, missing features, underdocumented things. And to, to make our platform as pleasant as possible, we need to get users used to frequently updating. So we decided that we will release once a month. No matter what we have, once a month we tag a release, we ship it to users. And we've done that twice so far, shipping. And we had small releases, but a small release is about 20 bug fixes. So that's still a decent number of paper cuts that we uh, fix and, and ship to users. Uh, meanwhile, we've been focusing on Contrib because, as I said, it's all about the ecosystem. Uh, so we've been focusing on stabilizing payment gateways and working on recurring, which you'll see. Uh, so in October, we released Braintree 1.0, which, as I said, is PayPal's best API. And it not only supports paying by card, but also paying with PayPal Express Checkout or PayPal Credit, which is this thing where you can choose the number of uh, installments in which you'll pay. Uh, and you do all of this directly from the site, so there's no redirection to PayPal. They just open a modal, you can log in with your PayPal credentials, and you're done. So it's really smooth, it's great, and PayPal's been basically telling us to divert all of our users to here. And you use your regular PayPal merchant account and so on. In November, we worked on authorize.net, which now has a beta 3 out. Matt tagged it from the airplane this morning. 
Uh, it's going to hit a release candidate by the end of December, most li likely. We've been conservative because we've basically rewritten most of it to merge their newest API called Accept.js, which reduces your PCI compliance level that's needed. Previously, you needed to be PCI D compliant, which is the level as if you're storing the credit cards yourself, which is crazy. And now they've reduced that significantly, so it's much safer and cheaper to do, and you can certify yourself versus paying someone $100,000 to certify you for PCI D. We also support T checks. That's important to some people. I have no clue what that is, to be honest. Uh, we, we don't use them on my side of the ocean. Uh, and now we've come to commerce recurring. Commerce recurring is the reason why we've had small releases of commerce, because this is it in more than a month of my time. Uh, and it's been an effort, effort sponsored by Torchbox, which is a British agency who funded the initial port that took two weeks. Then commerce guys who funded like six weeks of my time, and then finally other contributors uh, working on various bits and pieces. So the initial, uh, the, the basic idea of recurring is simple. You take the user's card, if it's prepayment, you also take an initial payment, and then every few weeks or months or years, you charge them again. So in a month, you create another recurring order in your system, you close it, you charge it. Every subscription system works the same way. And then on top of this, you have a few complications. So a billing period can be rolling, which means it starts from the subscription date. If my subscription started on December 7th, the next renewal date is January 7th, and then February 7th. But if it's a fixed period, then it's calendar-based. It means that my subscription runs from December 1st to January 1st. And if I subscribe in the middle of the month, then I will only pay a partial price, which is called prorating. So this is something that we need to support. Uh, then you also have two different kinds of billing where you either prepay, you pay at the beginning of your period, uh, which makes sense if you're charging for memberships, or, but then you also have postpaid billing where you might be charged at the end of the period. And that's use, useful if you have some kind of usage tracking happening. So uh, we count the, your bandwidth or the number of users that you're having and then we charge you based on that at the end of the month. Uh, that's basically all the theory that you need to have to understand recurring with any kind of system. Uh, and for us, we, what we have and what you can see here is a form for billing schedule. So each of our products references a billing schedule that says, okay, this is uh, a fixed cycle and renewal happens once a month. Uh, and then we can also configure retries. So what happens if a card couldn't be charged because a daily or a weekly limit was hit? So we say, let's try in a few days and keep trying. And then finally, if, it, if that didn't work, cancel the subscription uh, and of course send emails along the way and so on. This is called Dunning, the whole process. Um, the main use cases that we built commerce recurring for are donations. And for donations, you don't need to even use products. You can just use the commerce order module and then create orders on the fly. So I can say I'm donating $50 and then keep charging me $50 once a year or once a month or once a day if, if someone's willing to do that. Uh, we also support memberships through commerce license. So it's a module where when you complete checkout, uh, we award you a role or something that's connected to your license. So you can use that to have premium users or something where they pay once a month. Uh, one of the use cases that we don't support fully yet is charging for a SaaS solution. So the, the Drupal 7 version of this module of license billing was built to sell platform.sh, which was our, uh, a product that came from our previous company uh, where we would charge you for the number of sites that you have and so on. And finally, you might use it to sell physical products such as dollarshaveclub.com where people sell you razors every month uh, and, and ship it to you. Uh, I, I've marked that as future since that's something that will still need more work. The idea of beta one is to get this in front of developers who can then extend it for all of the different use cases. 
uh, in the background, this is powered by advanced queue, and I don't have time to go into that in a lot of detail, but we will have a blog post on that up soon. Uh, it, it basically allows you uh, to see how the renewals are going uh, and to retry and it, it handles a lot of the logic for us. And it's usable outside of a recurring context, which means that if you need to offload certain kind of processes and so that they can happen asynchronously, you can use advanced queue. Uh, in, we have a number of features that will happen in the future. All of these are about a day of work. Uh, patches very welcome. Uh, so things such as free trials, being able to attach a coupon to a subscription, renewing through sending invoices instead of actually charging cards, um, and it goes on from there. Uh, the, the important thing is that we have this very flexible base that allows these kinds of features to be attached. Um, when, when I talk about recurring, usually a, a question is why don't we just use Stripe or Braintree or Recurly? Why should we build this in Drupal? The problem with gateway specific solutions is that they tie you to that gateway. You can never switch to something else, uh, which can be a problem, especially since many clients are very tied to their choice of a gateway. So if you tell them we need to subscribe you to a completely different gateway, they might not like that. Uh, and the gateway is usually optimized for the simple use cases. So if you need something that's slightly different, you might be out of luck. So post-paid billing or fixed cycles, usage-based billing, all of that will still lead you back to custom code. Uh, so, and, and of course with e-commerce, the, the devil is always in the details. You always have uh, those small cases that end up taking more time. Uh, the real software as a service solutions for recurring are really expensive. So Recurly charges you between $100 and $300 a month to handle the logic for you. So for that kind of money, y you might as well handle it from Drupal. And finally, it's not easy to integrate two different systems. If you use the same system for your promotions, for calculating your taxes, uh, for managing your coupons, basically you you reduce the chances of something going wrong since a recurring order at the end of the day is just the same as a normal one. And I'm not sure we have a lot of time for questions, but let's give it a shot. When you do the recurring payments, where are you storing the uh, credit card information? Uh, you're storing a token, so serve pretty much the default payment gateway way of functioning right now is on-site gateways where the customer enters a credit card number. That credit card number is sent to the server through JavaScript and then the gateway gives you, the site, a token which is safe to store so that you're not under PCI compliance. And we save those tokens and we use them to charge again. But then it makes it difficult to switch gateways. Yeah, sure. You, well, it's simpler than being tied to their subscription service because what, what we, we've had this happen. This happened for us for platform.sh and we simply told customers go into your user panel and re-enter your card. We survived. Um, what's the mechanism if um, a customer feels that, you know, there's a fraudulent charge or something? I, um, what, com what kinds of tools does this have um, in addition to whatever the credit card or the, the gateway uh, provider would provide? Well, right now, none. The idea is you report a fraudulent charge, which then reaches Braintree or whatever your gateway is, and then Braintree pings Drupal to say, look, the payment with this ID has been reported as fraudulent, and then you go from there. So this is the, the part where we still haven't connected the dots. We need to be able to uh, respond to that webhook. We have the code for that, but we're still not bubbling up the warning uh, to the actual merchant, but it's something that will happen over time. Boyan, where uh, are you guys, where is on the roadmap uh, CRM integration like Salesforce with Drupal Commerce or Civi CRM? Drupal our, our general experience has been that integrating CRMs is usually very custom. So we've integrated Salesforce for ourselves, for a platform, for a number of other clients, and it has been a custom thing every time because usually the devil is in the mapping of the data, and that data is usually very custom. 
So, so far we have been unable to release anything that would help such a process because the, the generic parts are 10% of the effort. Uh, if we manage to land a client that can make us build something more generic, great, but so far it hasn't been easy. So right now, no actual plans driven by clients. One more. Um, so when you set up the recurring, if you have a recurring payment for someone, say every six months, right, and they've been paying, but then they stop paying at like the third, sixth month, or forget, or forgot, or they change their card and they come back. Now, do they have to? Can they start a new payment based on the old one, or is that a whole new? product they have to buy again to start that payment. Uh, it, it really depends on your business logic. So generally you will start the dunning process, you will send them emails, you will retry, they will enter the cart and it will resume. If after the dunning process is done you decide to cancel, the question is whether you destroyed their data already. If you didn't, you can allow them to resume. If you did, they will need to resubscribe. It, it, it's really specific to businesses. So, so the question is if you, if you allow them to resume, do they resume and start again at the point where they just start payment, or uh, you know, it's, that's or, a matter that's of your business I, logic. Okay. Yeah, so it, it, you would need to decide that. I, I wouldn't feel good deciding that. So I think we're done. All right, thank you. <laughs> Woo! Great. All right, thanks, Boyan. And if you have any other questions, obviously we'll be hanging around for beers and talking afterwards. Um, you can hand it to Matt. So next up is Matt Glomman from our team. Um, so I, I forgot to do like the personal intro. I met Boyan through the 2010 Google Summer of Code. Um, I was his mentor, he was my mentee. We talked about, I, we were doing commerce affiliate work at the time and um, he was finishing up a computer science degree so we convinced him to stop doing that and come work at Commerce Guys instead. Um, <laughs> and, and now he's Uncle Boyan to my kids and really just a part of my family. So. Um, so it's been a good seven years, and hopefully there will be many more. Uh, and then we met Matt um, later. I guess, Matt, you were contributing to various Drupal Commerce projects. Um, uh, another Drupal Commerce and previously Ubercart contributor, Andy Giles, in the community had brought Matt down to Drupal Camp Florida and Drupal Camp Atlanta and got him involved in the Drupal community. And so we wanted to bring him on board, but missed our first opportunity somehow. And then um, we're finally able to hire him in 2015 into Commerce Guys to do more direct work on Drupal Commerce and, and lead a lot of our consulting projects, especially when we started developing Drupal 8 sites. So Matt led the development for um, Sport Obermeyer um, in partnership with BlueSpark, that's online at obermeyer.com, a great um, case study also on drupal.org. He also leads development for LivePerson and BlueJeans um, subscription management platforms, which are, of course are two, I think two New York City based, right? Is, oh, okay, well LivePerson's here, but anyways. Big Drupal commerce customers, contributors, um, through all of the work that we do for them. And so really that's kind of like Matt's specialty in our team is, is leading the architecture and helping um, these, these guys adopt Drupal commerce and then making sure that as much of that work makes it back into Drupal as possible. And that doesn't just look like Drupal commerce modules. That includes things like the advanced queue module, which has you know many applications outside of the Drupal commerce context. Or if you think about Drupal 8 core, which has the entity reference field module, and it, that came out of Drupal Commerce work that we did for Cartier several years ago and then made its way into core. And then, you know, a lot of work that we've done in the Entity API, Composer, Rules, Views, all these other subsystems over the years kind of comes into these client projects and makes its way back into Drupal proper. Um, so what Matt will be talking about won't be directly related to Drupal Commerce, although his main use case is. Um, so one of our larger, still Drupal 7 sites um, based in Europe, um, you know, I needed to make sure they were ready to go for the holidays. And so we've been kicking around ideas about how to sort of standardize our load testing and performance tuning, um, I guess, routine. Uh, and so we trialed some new open source technology. Matt made it work, and that's what he's here to talk to you about. Um, and I guess I'll let you take it from here. And real quick um, about the Salesforce stuff, it is extremely hard to generalize for live person we use Salesforce. And actually the biggest blocker is it's got awful slow. Um, we actually had to use the big pipe technique and run all of our execution after flushing the data to the server or to the browser because it was 
causing conversion abandon and people were leaving the checkout before it fully completed and we weren't running off our API calls. Um, so I would like to actually see if we can add an event in Drupal Commerce that lets you run heavy processing of data after we flush everything to the browser. Um, yeah, we, that would be the proper thing is to add it to a queue. But at that time, we didn't have advanced queue when I furiously wrote it to try to improve our speed. All right, so as Ryan said, I'm gonna be talking about load testing with realistic user journeys. Um, so the first thing is, what's load testing? We talk about load testing, you think, it, it can mean a lot of things. You know, there's, there's actual definitions to it, but the way that I like to think of it is performance testing and analysis under pressure. You know, you're not necessarily just seeing, you don't wanna just stress test it, like you wanna analyze it. You need to take out meaningful insights from what you're doing. You know, so one, the main use cases is, if I get slash dotted, and if you're not used to this, just, you know, receiving heavy traffic out of the blue because something went viral. Will our CDN support that? And if our CDN fails, will the application support it? You know, that's what I think most people think of when they look at load test. Um, can our API support a DDoS attack and still serve our customers when that need to access data? And then one of the big ones, especially in e-commerce applications, how many transactions can our database handle? If I can't handle enough transactions, people won't convert, I lose money, I lose customers that won't come back. Which if you sell stuff online, it's not good if you can't make money. And then another one is, that's great if, the, if you have a strong database, but how does our system support, how well does our system su perform with CPU and memory under constraints? So, the difficult task. I started going through this and realized every load test tool is like, I'm gonna take this URL and I'm gonna hammer it with the wrath of God. But that's not realistic. That's not realistic in terms of marketing and different user behavior. So how do you take a load test and anticipate a marketing event? Black Friday, we have some new shoes coming out and all the sneaker freaks are gonna come out and buy them, or unexpected virality. Um, you're a news site and all of a sudden you have the breaking news that Trump's gonna move the US Embassy to Jerusalem. Are, are you prepared for people to go there and derive all the other content in your site? So I went through a bunch of open source um, tools such as Locust, Apache JMeter, Gatling, Artillery.io, Goad, The Grinder, then its successor, Ngrinder, and my favorite, Bees with Machine Guns. <laughs> I really wish these people would have made a logo. Um, supposedly it came out of the, the link said apps.chicagotribune.com, but that's a dead domain. I really wanted there to be a logo for that one. And then the other half of it is performance analysis tools. Right, so you do a load test, what does that give you? Like, you need to be able to know things about it, and I kind of grouped it into one half. The left half is passive profiling, and then the right-hand side is active profiling. So we're all familiar, who here has used New Relic? Who's heard of New Relic? Okay, New Relic's kind of like the de facto um, server side, application performance monitor. Then there's Datadog. Found out there's one called Jennifer, which actually looked really interesting. Um, and then there's App Dynamics, which I feel if you use Aquia's hosting, well, you have your New Relic's kind of supported by Aquia, Pantheon, and Platform, and none of these others are really listed in the Drupal hosting ecosystem. Um, then we have XHprof. That icon is for Tideways. They don't have like an, a logo that includes their lo their name in it. Tideways is a XHprof PHP 7, um, drop-in replacement, it's kind of a mix between Blackfire and raw XHprof. Blackfire started off as a fork of XHprof and is now a software as a service that lets you do active profiling. So when it came down to do load testing, my stack was using Locust, um, Amazon Web Services with Docker Swarm to be able to do my attacks, and then using New Relic and Blackfire for analysis. And so I'll kind of go through why I picked these and how we went through set up this load test. And this will kind of be almost like a retrospective of what I learned and what we did. Because um, it is interesting. Like I did a lot, I tried to do as much research as I can, bef as I could before Black Friday hit, but everything was very centered around, will my API survive? Will my page die? It's like, 
I don't care if the home page is up. I want them to make money. Um, so the first step was to use Locust. Um, has anybody heard of Locust IO? Who's heard of JMeter or used JMeter? All right. So I actually got the one of the maintainers or committers of JMeter on one of my what the heck kind of questions, um, point me to some information, give me some insights. But unfortunately, I didn't think it did enough. And I don't want to do Java, and I don't want to write XML. Um, they, they brought up to use recorded sessions. So in JMeter, you can record sessions. I go to this page. I click Add to Cart. I go to the checkout. There's a problem there. That's really static, right? That's one user doing the same thing in a repeatable fashion. Do your customers do that in your e-commerce site? It's not the same person doing the same thing all the time. You're, you have a lot of different interactions. So I wanted to be able to replicate those kind of interactions. So I wanted to do behavior-based load tests. Um, you know, rich sites need smarter load testing where you visit random web pages instead of just hitting the home page, the about page, and random APIs. Um, so, you know, content browsing. Some customers never buy things. They just read your content. Some go to the catalog they abandon. Some go to the product page, click every single button available. I'm like, eh, doesn't have my color. Um, cart creation, entering the checkout and abandoning the checkout. Checkout conversion. And then also, so you're in the middle of Black Friday, but your admins and store managers are processing things in the background. How does your site work when you're having back-end workflows processing, such as queues attacking your database? So with Locus, one thing that we're able to do is write the test cases in Python. I haven't written Python until I used Locus, so it was, a <laughs> it was a crash course for me. Luckily, it's not too bad. But I, I liked it more than JMeter, because JMeter, I could go in and I could click and kind of build my test case, but it was really hard to extract content on the website and say, do this thing. Like, try to randomize the Add to Cart form. So the snippet I have here is basically, you know, it has a helper to get to a page, but then they add a cart. What it does is it gets the cookie so that it reuses the same cart, and then it will find a random add to cart form on the current page and submit it. In the case of our customer, they have a single page with like 30 add to cart forms. So a person can go to a random page. I say buy five things at a random interval, and it picks five different products, random quantities, adds it to the cart, and then it asserts that the cart basket was updated each time. So that way, if it, let's say that a test failed because the added cart didn't go through, then it can kind of help see where things break down. And then inside Locust, you define um, the Locust users himself. And so in here, I had a user that just went home, browsed pages, left. So all they did was went to different content. I defined a user scenario that added some things to the cart. They went to checkout and then abandoned checkout. So, great, I have tests, I ran them locally, you know, hit like 100 concurrent users on my local machine, but that doesn't tell you anything. So we had to deliver tests at scale. And this is another reason why I picked Locust, is it was really easy to launch a huge attack. It had distributed um, load tests in mind. JMeter, apparently you can do it. The maintainer that sent me the thing on Twitter is like, well, if you put up an eight CPU machine, you can get about 1,000 concurrent users. Like, that's cool, that's one big machine. I'd rather like to do a distributed attack. Um, and to credit on there, you know, it could be ignorance on my part. But so what we set up is a Locust Docker image that we could deploy on a Docker Swarm using um, what is it? AWS CloudFormation. So basically, it's an AWS template, launches a whole bunch of random things and pub subs and not, that's over my head, but I knew I could take one host, 10 to 20 different slave instances of Locust, and launch a huge attack. Um, and kind of a sample Docker file there. Um, it does have PhantomJS. So using a base HTTP runner, you know, not a true emulated browser, it's able to do about 9,000 concurrent users that were performing about 450 requests per second. And at that, that's when the server, it did, the server didn't break, there were some hiccups. Um, but using Locust and the Python script, we were able to achieve this level of insight. Um, at first, I did work with PhantomJS, and I got about 300 active users doing about 30 requests per second. And then PhantomJS 
cried and broke all over itself. Um, I did use headless Chrome on my local machine with my Mac, and it worked flawlessly and was fast. Put it in uh, Docker, and it cried. Uh, so this part, I wanted to bring it up because it is possible to use an actual browser um, to do you the load testing. I think that some of the issues might have been the library I was using, which may allowed Locust to run, you know, Phantom JS, um, headless Firefox, headless Chrome. But I think there's some quirks that need to be worked out. So I got 9,000 users doing 450 requests per second. Great. So I had things that were timing out. I had bad status lines. I had things breaking all around me. Only at 10%, though, which I think if 10% of an error rate on that and I can't like fully control the environment, it's fairly decent there. Um, the first thing that you should do is passive profiling, um, which is kind of opposite to how I normally think. I'm a very active performance driven developer. Like I want to know where my bottlenecks are when I'm writing it. You can't do that in a load test. In a load test, you kind of have to let it run and then see where things fail. Um, I found out in New Relic that if you make something crash bad enough, it gives you a stack trace, which shows you where things bottleneck. Um, and then with the active profiling, once we've found those bottlenecks, we can go, okay, here's where something broke. Let's bring it local and start analyzing it on that smaller level. Um, so who, has anyone here used Blackfire at all? Okay, if you haven't and you notice your site's a little slow, you can use it for free. I recommend just trying it out because you can probably find like, hey, this one module is hogging up all my stuff. Highly recommend it. Um, and so once you start running the load test, you're doing the passive profiling, and then you start looking at some of the active stuff, you need to be aware of the death of a thousand cuts I got. I, this, I'll, I'll cover it and I'll go back to that image actually in the next one to show why that was important in that image. Um, Subtle changes can actually lead to a big payoff under pressure, under high load. You say, oh, well, this hook runs three times and it should really only run one. Well, I don't have the time to refactor it. Well, what happens if you have 450 requests per second running at three times a s each request? It's 12,000 function calls. That's, you know, two-thirds times than it needs to. So passive profiling, as you see, the cumulative breakdown over time active profiling as you go take that information and then solve the problems. Um, so here's some examples of things that we did fix. Um, table indexes matter. We, on that previous screenshot, it showed a table transaction um, for their inventory. And we didn't have an index on the product ID. And we were doing bulk updates of the inventory for that product ID. And it, uh, the added cart performance was dying basically, and when entering checkout when the order refresh was going on. So you can see here, our top queries are rules config select because rules is the worst performance module out there. And then the two stock queries. We added that index and those database queries just went away. They stopped even showing up in our list. So if you do have your own schema or if you see a module that's malperforming, maybe it has got some field data and maybe that needs an index on there. And again, this is one that you can't find in active profiling. This is something I would not have found if I was just taking a single request on my machine. We had to take the site at scale in order to uncover it. Um, entity wrappers are hell. Uh, does everybody here use entity metadata wrappers in Drupal 7? Yeah, I did too. And then I started seeing what they do to your performance and it ruins your site. Um, there's actually a problem. If you use Drupal Commerce and you're gonna go to PHP 7, don't use a lot of entity metadata wrappers or don't use the commerce gift card module because you'll receive seg faults. Um, there's something weird with memory management that we haven't quite been able to figure out, but if you turn off garbage collection, there's no more seg faults. So we're actually taking a community initiative um, to try to fix entity metadata wrappers and also the contrib modules using them so people can get onto Dru on PHP 7 with Drupal Commerce, because you can, and not experience these bugs. So this allowed us to perform a few patches. Um, and if I'm going to post these slides, but there's actually a link to the bug on the PHP bug tracker. Um, and then finding perform nah, perp, performance backports as well. So in this picture, we found the site's on Drupal 7 with Drupal Commerce. And in Drupal 8, it does this fancy thing that if a field on an entity does not change, it doesn't write it to the database. But currently in Drupal 7, it's always right, right, right. Somebody backported it, it's tagged for Drupal 
And by applying that patch, this query is on an added cart form where we save some line items and we save the order. And they attach a lot of marketing data to the orders. By applying that patch, I cut down 50 queries and save 20 milliseconds. That's not calling it 20 milliseconds yet, but 20 milliseconds at scale when your database is under pressure is a big deal. So I had actually brought up to you, Matthew, about like if you find performance issues, look for patches. Is there might be performance patches in the queues that you can just apply. So if you're not a coder, you know, I found this bug, I don't know, think I can fix it myself, you might be able to find it in the drupal.org issue queue. Or, better yet, open an issue about it so that way we can make Drupal fly. And so to follow up on all that, one, one reason we picked our stack is, like I said, the load testing patterns felt really they're antiquated and old for older generation sites, not rich content sites, right? Drupal's all about making rich experiences, powerful websites. The load testing patterns that I found didn't really fit that. Um, I also felt like I was rewriting Behat. Have people used Behat here for behavior driven t development and all that? Or, so for those that aren't familiar, behavior driven development is like, I go to the page. I click this button, and when something fails, you know that the test failed. Really felt like I was rewriting that, but in order to do a load test. Um, so I was really hoping that there, I was hoping to find a multi-runner for that. Um, and then also I realized that estimating the testing resources is hard. We got a nice AWS bill because I forgot to kill one of the cloud stacks for five days. <laughs> Um, so that was one thing that was really hard, is we want to be able to deliver at scale, but did I need 10 nodes to be running as slaves, or did I only need five to hit that limit? What was my max limit? Maybe I could have been running 50,000 users, but the site didn't need to hit that much in order to show problems. And out of all those tools I listed, each has their pros and cons. I forgot to put up the speaker notes for myself, but Goad is written in Go, and it actually launches up Goad will run, Goad will actually spin up its own EC2 instances and, and do the load test for, against APIs. Um, Gatling is the same thing but written in JavaScript. It will launch that. No, Gatling does Lambda, fun, Lambda, Lambda, serverless functions. So it will actually spin up serverless functions on AWS to perform your load test for you, which blew my mind but doesn't let you do like behavior driven load testing. Um, so it'd be neat to see if some of these like were able to merge, to have this like behavior driven development that automatically scaled your resources as needed. That I need to get 5,000 users, oh my load testing, like Locus is kind of like dying on its CPU for the amount of instances. I need to scale up another server and kind of make it a much more robust attack. And those are actually things that I'm starting to work on. Um, I didn't put it in here, but I started working on a tool that uses React PHP to run a version of Locust written in PHP, though I realize PHP will never do what Python or Go can do. But it's one thing that I'm starting to look into to see how we can deliver a better open source tool or at least contribute to Locust to kind of bring these things full circle. So, um, questions? Or anybody that just has, who's been thinking about doing load testing but doesn't know how to get started. It worked, they, they survived Black Friday, and we made like a, we delivered about 10 different performance enhancements, and like I said, some of those went back as patches to, to commerce discount, commerce coupon, none to commerce itself, because those were delivered beforehand. Um, like I said, with the entity module, we came up with a way that it reuses entity Drupal wrappers, so that way you're not doing object thrashing and causing garbage collection to be thrown. So, so those are some good results. What was that? No, 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 no. So Locust, you have to run on a server. Um, so you can just, it's just a command line. Like you just say, Locust, here's my Locust file. There's a different um, testing tool. Uh, yeah, that would be Goad, I believe. Goad will do its own, Gatling. Hmm? Go, yeah. So I believe Goad spins up its own EC2 instances, as does bees with ma machine guns. And then Gatling fires up Lambda um, functions. Gat Gatling does Lambda. 
I'm pretty sure. Again, you can Google it. Like I said, I don't, I don't know how to open my speaker notes once I'm already in presenter mode. Um, but it's, it's interesting. It's definitely one to go research and find these things because it could be a use case. You might have Drupal that's just serving your API. And you just need to do that kind of load testing. It's definitely a disproportionate number of Gs up there. <laughs> I was wondering, uh, and this is more maybe more of a question for the MDC crew, but uh, the load testing that you were doing, um, how does that compare to so the um, the MDC kinds of, of loads that uh, have been discussed before? I remember big pipe discussions, but with heavy media streaming and things like that. I mean, I was wondering if that's a very different um, different requirements for the load testing. I would probably say the biggest difference is from the beginning of your talk when you when you were talking about like be intelligent about the use cases that you're going to hit. We have one use case. A lot of people want to watch a video. That's our use case. We don't, we're not selling anything. We don't have a, a a complicated like site matrix of getting from here to there or bandwidth. Know, ba right. It's it's bandwidth. It's you know that first one that you said uh, the the getting slash dotted. Like we would never get slash dotted, but we would get a massive amount of traffic for a particular video. So we hit it hard and we see what happens. Does that require a lot of database interaction? Because I know there's a database. Um, not usually, so right? Because like commerce, by definition, you don't really want it to be anonymous because it's probably not good. Like where do you ship the package? Um, but, but for us, like most of our traffic is anonymous. As far, you know, from a, a, a Drupal point of view, um, we don't we don't care, right? So no. And that's a good point to make with this too. Is a lot of part of this is anonymous, but the other part they have well they bypass this section, but it's it bypasses caches. Where with your use case, you can serve it off the CDN. You yeah, need to just make sure that the media has a bandwidth because everything like you could have a deployed CDN and not ever have to worry about nginx dying. Mm -hmm. Because everybody's just going to one page and then streaming a video. Yeah. So again, it, you have to do a lot of research on your needs too. Um, that was what I found myself frantically doing as I found tools: is what do I really need to test? Yeah. I, one one other difference I would say is NBC News certainly has some interesting use cases because they want to make sure that they can still go on and and edit and break new stories while. We're getting a massive amount of, of load, and even I mean, we certainly are, make heavy use of CDNs, and, and news does as well. But even you know, even just the edge traffic during a real like major event can be significant, right? And we have to make sure that we're able to get in, um, get in and, and update the news at that point. Frankly, we've you know had a tremendous decoupling effort at this point, so that those two things aren't really related. But it might be interesting if at some point. The more the commerce side starts to do well, I'll do some more streaming. I would like the people start purchasing. I don't know clicks or whatever. If that ever happens, then then those two kinds of uses would kind of merge. Just so, sort of. Explain this. More. I, I would say not really because the purchasing side of it is you can get lucky. The same. Um, luckily, with that, it's a different job. But so, like I brought up before, database transactions, CPU, and memory time. Your database, you can you know scale more databases. CPU and memory, you get more app servers, or you just fix your code. Media, you have a dedicated domain that has no cookies right. or session and has its own CDN. So you can luckily, so that's why I, you, like the research, you can figure out how do I split this? Where's my main concern? You know, for our case, the database is like we can scale the database. That's no problem. We identified our bottleneck with CPU and memory usage, and that you know, okay, we made the code as performant as we could. The better fix would be PHP 7, but there's a seg fault issue, so we just scaled app servers to help, you know, complement our known problems. All right, thank you very much. Woo! Woo! It works on both mics. Woo! Thank you to all our speakers. Uh, can you put the? I got a few wrap-up things. Uh, it's the last Drupal meetup of the year of December, so yay to us. But we really do have to there thank uh, a person who's been really uh, working very hard. She couldn't be here tonight, uh, Holing Poon. I want to just get a big round of applause for her. Yay, Holing. She'll watch it on YouTube later.
She's on a deadline tonight, and so she couldn't be here. Also, Chris Brando in the back has been, you know, taping this and editing it and then putting it up on YouTube. Uh, so, a uh, quiet hero. And you could find all of our uh, past presentations on YouTube. What's our um, channel? It's just I think it's NYC. Triple NYC. We tried to be very cryptic about it. Uh, a couple other things. We, again, remember if you can, uh, would like to speak in January, think about it. Come to one of us. We really need the presentations. It doesn't have to be 20, 30 minute. It could be a five minute lightning round on some module you love or some case study you want to show. Uh, we are going to send out a survey in the next couple of days to hear from you uh, about what kind of topics you'd like for 2018, what kind of speakers you'd like to have come here. You know, I'm, I'm begging Dries pretty much on a regular basis now. I'm going to get him here. I'm going to get him here. I'm passing Acquia. I'm going straight to him. So, because uh, they, they, they're, uh, well, okay. We uh, have organized a uh, toy drive tonight. Anybody who did bring any toys, great. Uh, we'll bring them. Mani is going to be the uh, point person to get them to the right place in the building. Uh, again, if you want to volunteer uh, for Drupal Camp uh, NYC, come to see me immediately after this meeting. Uh, we are, uh, Gergay is organizing. We're actually working together to do a Drupal after work, tentatively scheduled. December 21st. It's really just after work. We get together for drinks and socialize. More information will be uh, sent out to you guys uh, through the Meetup channel. Uh, we have stickers that Neil Drum from the DA brought. They're in the back. Feel free to take one of each uh, and let others. Take a few of each and hand them out. Okay. Just Good stick stocking stuffers, right? Uh, that's all I got other than uh, the bills. Uh, you got anything else? Uh, just a couple, two quick things. First, the next meetup is on the first Wednesday of the next month. So that's January 2018. Make sure that you flip that year over in your calendar uh, right here in this room. Um, and then uh, after party, Bill's Bar, 51st Street, downstairs. Um, yeah, thank you everybody for coming. And, uh, and make sure that you bring two friends with you to the next meetup. Yay! All right. <laughs>